every Friday I do a rough draft of the sermon. It's a little different from what you get on Sunday morning, but uh, someone commented, oh no, Tom Holland again? Yeah, Tom Holland again. I have a great quote back when he published the book Dominion. He was on the podcast and he said this, and I wrote it down because I thought it said it so succinctly. Imagine you've got to write a story in which for the first time, somebody who suffers the excruciating death of a slave is going to be cast as being in some way part of the Creator God who's fashioned everything. And he's got to be convincing, not just to the people now, but for 2,000 years and across the span of the world. It's a really astonishing thing to have pulled off just as a literary feat. And that four people did it is amazing. So many of you grew up in church and you read those Gospels. We're at a place right now in American culture where a lot of people grew up without church. And they don't know anything of those Gospels. And then one way or another, they find themselves with this Bible, and usually they're maybe in their 30s, so they've got a little bit of maturity, and they start reading these stories of Jesus, and they're like, my goodness, has anybody read these? You guys want to say, yeah, for a long time. They're new to you, I get it. Uh, and, and that was the case in some ways for Tom Holland, who... You know, I've told you the story about his book, Dominion. I used the cover because it's got that Salvador Dali painting on it. And the conjunction with the book, I think, is so good. But Tom Holland, who spent his first years, six years in church, gave it up, did all these things, was writing about ancient history, wrote a book about the sources of Islam, which kind of annoyed a bunch of Muslim people. And so one person basically said, why don't you do to your religion what you did to ours? And he thought, well, I don't have a religion. And then he thought, well, maybe I'll do to Christianity what I did to Islam. And then he wrote Dominion. And then he, his life was changed. And one of, the, one of the things you'll hear him say quite often on Twitter or on podcasts is, Jesus is the greatest short storyteller of all time. The stories of Jesus... Again, for 2,000 years we've been reading this, these stories and they continue to baffle us. Now, this is one friend of mine, John Verbeke, you might have heard me talk about it. He's, he's not a Christian, he teaches cognitive science at University of Toronto. He um, grew up in a Christian home, a very rigid home, a lot of, a lot of trauma, and so he left the faith. And then the guy next to him, Jordan Hall, I don't know near as well, didn't grow up at all in a Christian home, and they've been talking about all sorts of things that it would take me way more than half an hour to talk about them all here, but Jordan Hall going all around the world looking for some way to address the meaning crisis or the meta crisis. And so finally, he and his partner and their daughter had a whole list of communities all around the world that he wanted to go to to find a place and a way that he could really live the kind of life he wanted. And he went through almost every community on that list, tried them, checked them off, and then kind of they were looking to one last community. And on the way there, they drove through this little town in North Carolina and where like 93% of the people are Christian, and they looked around, and they said, this is it. And then they got an Airbnb and been living there, and someone invited his wife to church. And then she went a few times, and then she brought him, and he's become a Christian. He married his, the, his partner in the church on a Wednesday night. They had a potluck for the reception, and he got baptized, and now, Everyone is sort of a buzz that Jordan Hall became a Christian. And for him, it was like, I grew up in America, surrounded by Christians, but never thought to pay any attention to it. It was the last place I looked, and there I found what I was looking for. 
in this conversation where they're trying to sort things out, so much of the stuff is going on on the internet, and, and up comes this reference, which someone looked up and then sent to me by a book by Sally McFaig, which talks about the parable. And it's, the chapter starts with this parable. It was very early in the morning. The streets were clean and deserted. And I was on the way to the railway station. As I compared the tower clock with my watch, I realized it was already much later than I had thought. I had to hurry. The shock of this discovery made me feel uncertain in my way. I was not very well acquainted with the town, and yet fortunately there was a policeman nearby, so I ran to him and breathlessly asked him the way. He smiled and said, for me you want to learn the way? Yes, I said, since I can't find it myself. Give it up, give it up said he, and turned away with a great sweep, like someone who wants to be alone in his laughter. You probably listened to this story and thought, well, that's not very nice. That's kind of like a bad dream. But the writer of this story is actually a very famous author, author and once I name him, some of you will say, oh yeah, I get it now. Kafka. Kafka would write these stories of frustration. This is a parable, and, and this parable sort of leaves you stuck in a place to ask questions. Well, how do I think about the police? But what, what are my expectations of this world? It's all Kafka would write these novels that would leave people sort of frustrated because there's no solution, and that's what this parable does. Now, I use this because it's very difficult in a church to use the word parable and not have all of you think about the parables of Jesus because those are most of the parables you've ever known. There's a quality to parables often that there's, they seem to not have a bottom. The parable doesn't get resolved right away. You can understand it, you sort of get it, but there's something that sort of lingers with it. Now, Jesus, the greatest parable teller that ever lived, but the Old Testament has parables too. And if you know the Old Testament well, sometimes you find that Jesus is taking an Old Testament parable and he's bringing it into his world. And that's what we have today. Isaiah 5. I will sing for the one I love. A song about his vineyard. Hmm. Who's singing? And who's him? My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a good crop of grapes. This is what anybody laboring to build a vineyard would be looking for. Grapes, which then will make wine, but it yielded only bad fruit. Oh, what's, what's this story about? Now, you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, and some of you will look up and say, oh, this is from Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet towards the end of the story, not the very end like Jeremiah, but late in the story of the southern kingdom of Judah. You dwellers of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard, Isaiah. No, no, no. This is the Lord speaking through Isaiah. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Why did Israel and Judah not give to the Lord what the Lord was looking for. What was the Lord looking for? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. 
Now, this is Isaiah speaking to the people of Jerusalem and saying that what the Lord is going to do is to destroy his vineyard. <clears throat> the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. He looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. There's a parable about a vineyard and a story. And we actually know what happens in this story. On the seventh day of the fifth month of the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the commander of the imperial guard, an official of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. The whole Babylonian army, under the commander of the imperial guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. And you can just imagine those in Jerusalem at the time remembering the parable of Isaiah, the parable of the vineyard, and thinking, I will break down those walls, and briars will grow. Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guard, carried into exile all the people who remained in the city, along with the rest of the populace and those who had deserted the king of Babylon to the king of Babylon. But the commander left behind some of the poorest of the land who worked the vineyards and the fields. Hmm. Well, we've been walking with Jesus to Jerusalem. And remember, this started way up in Caesarea Philippi. Caesar, Philip, father of Alexander. Who do people say that I am? Well. Last week, the rich young ruler says, Jesus, great teacher. Okay. People think you're a prophet. Okay. Peter, what about you? You're the Messiah sent by God to deliver us. And Jesus says, I will tell you exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be killed. And on the third day, rise again. Of course, they didn't understand the rise again part. But they just heard arrested and killed and thought, oh, this isn't the plan. And so Peter pipes up. And Jesus took him, looked at the disciples, and rebuked Peter in front of the rest of them and said, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, a little bit later, they arrived in Jerusalem. Now, this is the second story from Jerusalem in Mark. They arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders came to him. These are the people in charge in Jerusalem, and they've managed to somehow keep the peace between Rome and Jerusalem, and they're trying to keep the system going, and they've done pretty well by the system. By what authority are you doing these things? Now, we're going to get to the first time Jesus came in, the triumphal entry. We're going to get to that next time. Or we're going to get to that on Palm Sunday. And they want to know, Jesus, you're causing this ruckus in Jerusalem. What's, by whose authority are you causing this turmoil? We're trying to keep the status quo as we want it. Jesus replied, I'll answer I'll answer, I will ask you one question. Answer me that question, and I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven, or was it of human origin? Tell me. Now, is this a question because it's hard? Remember last week when this, this guy comes up and asks Jesus a question, the, the disciples are probably sitting back watching because it's like, you don't just kind of stroll up to Jesus and ask him a question and think you're going to get a straightforward answer. Jesus, Jesus is always doing something. And so they come to Jesus and say, Jesus, you're causing all this trouble. 
Tell us by whose authority, because it's a trap, because they want him to say, it's by God's authority, and then they'll call him a blasphemer and go and kill him. But Jesus knows exactly how they are. These are middlemen. These are people who are about going along to get along, and they're the ones who are supposed to stand basically in line with God, but they're completely captured by their money and their audience. So Jesus says, I'll tell you. You tell me and everyone here about John the Baptist, would you? So what about John the Baptist? John the Baptist was very popular. Everyone went out to get baptized by him. What happened to John the Baptist? John the Baptist was killed. By whom? By a Herod. Why? John the Baptist didn't go along to get along. They discussed it amongst themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, well then why did you, why didn't you believe him? Why were you happy when he was basically pushed off the scene and murdered? But if we say of human origin, well, they feared the people, for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus said, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. And right there you see just what Jesus did. Because they're cowards. And Jesus is saying, you're cowards. And by answering this question, you know exactly what I mean. But you'd rather do things on the side. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. Remember, if you go all the way back to a number of sermons, Jesus talks to the crowd in parables, speaks plainly to his disciples. So now, now on the stage of Jerusalem, Jesus, I've got a parable for you. You probably begin to recognize it. A man planted a vineyard. Oh, everyone there. Everyone there knows Isaiah 5, like you all know the 23rd Psalm. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it. He dug a pit for the vineyard and built a watchtower. It's taken exactly from Isaiah 5. Ah, but Jesus has a twist. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. Everyone's been praying for the Lord to come back. But while the Lord's been away, who's been tending his vineyard? Oh, all the people that just asked Jesus that question. They're the people who are running the vineyard. How's the vineyard going? At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. John the Baptist was beheaded. A lot of people have seen the illusion, the connection there. Then he sent still another, and that one they killed. And he sent many others. Some of them they beat, and others they killed. This is a funny parable. He had one left to send, a son, whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is his heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. Some of you might remember last week, we talked about Mark 10. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Right before that, Jesus had said, hmm. when they were pushing the children away, Jesus said, Let the children come to me. Why? Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as them. Truly I tell you, Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Huh. This is the heir. Come, let's kill him. 
and the inheritance will be ours. These are not children receiving an inheritance. This is not even someone who is thinking, I'm going to use morality to qualify myself for an inheritance. No. This is murder and theft. Now, the funny thing about parables is often you can just easily understand them. So they took him, this beloved son, and they killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Oh, they understood exactly what Jesus was saying. And he's going to drive in a Bible point. Haven't you read the passage from Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. When I was in the Dominican Republic, we would build these little houses and churches for people, and if you've ever, it's, there's usually one or two room buildings, and they're not that large, and then they're made up of cement block, but I'll tell you, if you're going to run a line of cement block, what's the first thing you need to do? You need to set in those corners, and they need to be square. You need to get that thing all lined up, because if that cornerstone isn't square, the whole building is going to be messed up. It's the first, most important thing to set. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. We see it, and we, 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 it's just, some are happy, some are sad, but it's, it's like a miracle. Then the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away and thought, we'll get him when the time is right. We'll grab him at night, and we're going to get him. <coughs> and they will. So was Jesus saved? We asked that question last week. Hmm. That's Usually we ask, is he saved or is she saved? And, and we've looked at sort of salvation after life and, and, well, the assumptions of this life. And last week we talked about the rich young man and he went away sad. And Jesus says these strange things. How hard it is to enter the kingdom of God for the wealthy person. I thought, no, I thought a wealthy person was blessed. And Jesus says, with man, this is impossible. Well, with God, all things are possible. And, and, and they're, they're just trying to figure out if, if the wealthy aren't just exhibits of God's blessing, then who can be saved? And someone should have stopped the disciples and said, what do you mean by that funny word? For a lot of people, religion is mojo from on high to live your best life now. My sister's been playing around with AI and, and she made these seat covers in cars and it's quite hilarious. <laughs> Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. Now, now they have the people who were basically in charge and said, well, now we're going to send somebody else. Because if we can get Jesus to say something wrong, we can get him. So then they came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity, that you aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. So they're listening to the crowd and, okay, so all of these, the chief priests and the elders and the teachers of the law, we know they're all bought and paid for by Aaron. We get it. But Jesus, yeah, Jesus, you're a straight shooter. You're a straight shooter, so let's catch you shooting straight, and then we'll get you arrested and killed. Is it right to pay imperial tax to Caesar or not? Oh, here's a gotcha question. 
Or should we pay, or shouldn't we pay? Because if Jesus says, yes, it's right to pay Caesar, aha, you're sold out just like the rulers. If Jesus says no, oh, you're an insurrectionist and we'll have you crucified. It's a no-win question. Jesus knew their hypocrisy. It wasn't a truthful question. They didn't really want to ask a very difficult question. So what they did was they asked this question to trap him. Why are you trying to trap me, he said. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought him the coin and he asked them, whose image is on it? And who's the inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to him, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Almost everybody knows that line. Well, what is it? Well, what does it mean? Well, money comes from the government. Why do you think it's got their name and their pictures on it? Money, the government gives you money so you can pay taxes. That's why the government gives you money. Now, we use it for other things, but it all belongs to them. But what does it belong to God? So the question just sort of leaves you, what do I do with this? Jesus' parables continue to provoke. This parable of the vineyard, we might sort of look at it and say, ah, Jesus was speaking that against them. Yeah. <laughs> Did God bring Babylon to judge Israel? Yes. The Bible says so. Will God bring Rome to judge Jerusalem again? Yeah, he did. The temple will again be destroyed in 70 AD. How is that destruction related to the first? And how is it relatable to Jesus? And what exactly is the reign of Caesar? And how does that relate to us? See, this gets into this question again, was Jesus saved? Because we might like hearing the answer, well, God is going to bring judgment and destroy. Yes. Just on them. What about us? Huh. Jesus' rivals feared the crowd more than they feared Jesus. Hmm. wonder what would be said of us. Jesus was pretty plain that they should be fearing the God who sent Nebuchadnezzar more than Nebuchadnezzar. In short, in short order, Jesus' rivals, however, will seem to win. Because I'm sure they said, Jesus had all these fancy answers up there on the Temple Mount, but we got him. And they will. There are two central points in this statement that Jesus is the parable. Because he is. He doesn't just speak parables. He's like a parable. And parables are like him. Jesus, as the parable of God, did not tell people about the kingdom. He did that. He told people about the kingdom. But he was the kingdom was Israel. And the way his whole life brought people to the kingdom was through a juxtaposition of the ordinary within the startling new context. You're going back and forth between, well, this is about Israel. Well, this is about Israel before Nebuchadnezzar. This is about Israel before, but this is also about us. And Jesus comes to us and basically posts it and says, where are you in this story? And where is Jesus in this story? That's why these parables are so disorienting. If, this the if theology is to be parabolic, meaning it goes back and forth, it must attend very closely to these features. That is, it must not be concerned primarily with explaining or systematizing the concepts about the kingdom, but must look carefully at the way parables function both the ones in the New Testament and Jesus as parable. The goal of the parable is not to impart a concept. The goal of the parable is to provoke and to say, what am I to do with this? Where am I in this story? What does this story have to do with me? Why can't I get to the bottom of it? 
So they took him and they killed him. And they threw him out of Jerusalem. What will the owner of Jerusalem do? He will come and kill those tenants and give Jerusalem to others. And he does. Does it end there? Does the pattern end there? Because the stone the builders rejected has become a cornerstone. Well, well, well what stone is that? Well, it's Jesus, obviously. You all knew that. And he is the cornerstone. And when we try to take him out of the building, the whole building collapses. And so it never goes beyond Jesus, but you never exhaust him either. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, Jesus was not saved from the hands of his culture war rivals or from the empire. They will get him. He will be killed. Christians would repeatedly repeat this suffering. They go out into the Roman Empire, and guess what? They get killed too. Oh, not always physically, sometimes. Because this way of Jesus can't be contained. We try to make a little system of it, but he keeps, like a parable, breaking out of that system and reforming and reshaping. And, and the scary thing about it is what the, what, the, what the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders were terrified of, which was losing themselves, is exactly what Jesus does. And that's how the story keeps going. Christians have and are inheriting a kingdom. It's always the same, and yet it's always fresh. And it's here in the strange way it was for Jesus. And I see that around me all the time. People who sort of get ossified, and then those who find the new life. It's interesting, even looking at my friends, oh, I, I, I can't look at Christ because Christianity is problematic. And then those who have never really known it come in and say, my goodness, why have I never seen this? But it almost always boils down to Jesus and his way of life and what he did, that we ourselves become the parable. Because sometimes parables are made up of stories that are sort of fantastical like that policeman. Almost a dream. And sometimes parables are historical. Because on the night Jesus was betrayed, you're not. We all know that the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders, they want Jesus dead. Because they think if we can, if we can shut him up and we can get rid of him, the problem will go away. <laughs> but here's the thing about Jesus. He doesn't go away. <laughs> because on Easter, he's going to come back. And, and they would all imagine, and we would imagine that when Jesus comes back, Jesus is going to knock on Herod's door and say, how do you like me now? And he's going to go to the chief priest and say, look at the holes in my hands, but I'm still here. He's not even going to do that. He's going to go to his disciples, and he's basically going to say, now I'm going to ascend up into heaven, and I'm going to send my spirit down, and you're going to repeat this story that I just did, in your life too. And we think, I, I, maybe I'd like Caesar's story or Alexander's story because, uh, I don't know that you would. But Jesus, your story is so costly. Yeah, it is. But Easter is coming too. Don't forget that. So in the night that is betrayed by one of his chosen 12, he takes bread and he breaks it. And he said, this is my body, this broken bread, in pieces. 
It's just bread. It's like human life in the Roman Empire. It's worth almost nothing. He said, this is my body. And it's broken. That's not news. Here's the news. It's for you. My body is broken, not out of randomness. It's broken for you. Every time you eat this, and again, it's sort of parabolic. What do you mean? You mean like at the Lord's table in church? Yes. But also when you're at home and you're just having a meal and you've got to do it every day and you pick up a little 